Morning, everybody. Let's open with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege of your worship. We thank you for giving us your word. We ask, O oh Lord, now that you would grant us the presence and interpretive power of your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds to understand what we learn from your word and to apply it for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... Last week we talked a little bit about the creation of man as God's image and likeness, some of the implications of that. Then we talked a little while about the fall, um, which is critical for understanding redemption, because the purpose of redemption uh, begins with reversing the fall. So we need to understand, but before we understand the person and work of Christ, which is our salvation, we need to understand the consequences of the fall. That way we know what we're praising and thanking him for. So that is critically important, uh, not only for our doctrine, but also for the substance of our praise. The, the material, the substance of our worship. All right, so <clears throat> we are basically still at the very end of that little subparagraph there called the fall. We saw how in Genesis 1, 31, uh, mankind as created was described as very good by the Lord. And then by the time we get to Genesis 6 and Genesis 8, the Lord's assessment of mankind has changed. And now he says in those texts, that all the thoughts and intents of man's heart are only evil continually. <clears throat> all only continually from his youth up. From his youth up is the post-flood assessment. So that's about where we left off. Uh, I was asked a question um, about... Uh, how it is that uh, we suffer the consequences, in effect, of someone else's sin. So I'm obviously referring to Adam there. Uh, we are all born in that state that, we, you know, we surveyed some texts from the New Testament as well as the Old Testament to describe how this negative assessment, this divine assessment uh, about fallen man you know, all the thoughts and intents of his heart are only evil continually from his youth up. That's consistent. That assessment continues whether you're looking at the prophets, the Psalms, or the apostles, or our Lord's words directly quoted by the apostles in their circle. You notice I have two drinks here. Oh, am I supposed to push this button? We're good? Yeah, it's don't touch it. <laughs> Last week it was, don't forget to. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. Glad you're here. Uh, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's critically important to understand it, not only that we're, not only so that, critically important to understand uh, the relationship between us as Adam's children and him, uh, not only so that we're thinking biblically about that subject, but so that we can understand in all of its fullness the relationship of Christ to his people. Because according to the scriptures, these are parallel to one another. The relationship between Adam and fallen mankind and the relationship between Christ and those whom he represents. <coughs> redeemed mankind. Okay, so let's talk about this. Uh, Looking at the outline, I, I note that mankind has become corrupted and guilty. You notice in that subsection for the fall. And again, if this is the first time looking at this outline, this was created for the membership classes for vows three and four to study those subjects uh, before asking uh, folks to take that vow. So just ignore the top. The, it's, the, it's the substance of the outline that we're dealing with. So corrupted and guilty, these are two sides of a coin, as it were. 
we inherit from Adam as a fallen human being who only began to beget after his own kind and likeness after he fell. And being fallen, he could do nothing else than beget fallen creatures. And you can see that too, again, that's reinforced by those divine assessments of the family of fallen mankind, Adam's descendants in Genesis 6 and Genesis 8 that we already quoted. So that's the corruption side, isn't it? When the Lord says that all the thoughts and intents of man's heart are only evil continually from his youth up, when Paul says, by nature, we are children of wrath, even as the rest of mankind, by nature. That, these things go to the corruption, the hereditary corruption that we have inherited from Adam, the proneness to sin, the fallenness of heart, the hardness of heart to the things of the Lord. These are all things that can be classified as that aspect of our connection to Adam that is natural. We are like him in that way. We share that fallen nature with him. And that's the state of mankind since the fall. And no one escapes it because we are all descended from Adam and we are all heirs of his nature, his fallen nature. That can't be gainsaid from the Bible. That can't be disputed from the Bible. The Bible's very clear on that. What gets perhaps a little less press is the other side of the coin. That we are, in fact, according to the scriptures, condemned for Adam's transgression. It's not simply that we suffer consequences of his fall in inheriting from our birth, from our conception, rather, as Psalm 51 actually points out. From our very conception, we inherit this fallen nature. But also, we have this concept that's related to it, but distinct from it, reflected in the scripture that we are actually condemned in God's court for having eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We share that guilt. His guilt is imputed to us as if we did it. The Lord's not confused in thinking, were well, these people actually present in Eden at the same time and actually physically pulled the apple off the tree, and, or the fruit, I should say. We don't know what kind of tree it was. And then ate it ourselves? No, he, he's not confused about that. He knows we weren't actually there. But we are nevertheless condemned for his sin, at his transgression at that time. Yeah. We would each stand on our own before yeah. him as an individual. Yeah, we touched we touched on this later that the human creation is a little distinct from the angelic creation in that the angel, angels are distinct discrete creations of God as individuals. They don't beget one another. They don't have generations of angels the way we do of humanity. So there are things at work in God's relations to humanity that do not obtain in his relations with the angels. Each of them do stand individually before God on their own feet. They have no representative before God. But the Lord, in his governing of humanity and his, his, his determination on how to interact with us, has made an organic tie and, you know, we discussed that, we share his nature, that's what I mean by an organic tie, but also he has decided, and the, the Bible reflects this, that Adam acted as our representative, of the representative of all whom he would beget. 
Adam was our representative before God. So his actions stood for the actions of his offspring. It's important to understand that. That goes right to the covenant of works, which we should talk about before we move on much further. Um, Let's turn in our Bibles. Before we go and talk about the covenant of works, let's talk first, let's substantiate from the scripture what I claimed already, that we are not only corrupted by being descendants of Adam in our fallen natures, our proclivity for sin and rebellion. Uh, Please turn to Romans 5. We are also condemned for what Adam did in Eden. And this goes to his representation of us. Romans 5. Starting at verse 16. Verse 16 of Romans 5. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now here's the, uh, the most important verse in this text to substantiate this claim, that we are condemned in Adam. This whole, con- this whole text is dealing with our relationship with Adam and our relationship with Christ. Therefore, verse 18, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, We'll stop there. As one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Sometimes we need the context to best understand what's meant by all. Given what we've looked at so far, when it says all men here in verse, the first half of verse 18, What is suggested, knowing what we know about the scriptures, what we talked about, the Bible and its assessment of fallen mankind. When it says one trespass, let's start there. What is this one trespass he's referring to? Adam's sin. Therefore, as Adam's sin led to condemnation for all men, who is all men in such a context as this? That'd be us. That'd be us. That'd be all of us. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about this word condemnation. In the Greek, this word is katakrima, and it's a forensic term. Katakrima is a forensic term. And by forensic, we mean judicial. It's a courtroom term. It's forensic. It's legal in nature. It's a courtroom term. And it involves not only the verdict of guilty, but the imposition of the sentence. So it's a very complete word, and it includes the idea of a verdict of guilt. So when Paul tells the churches, of which we are one, One trespass led to condemnation for all men. He gives us divine revelation on something very important, not only for understanding the the comprehensive nature of the fall, but also what, what Christ has done for us in coming into the world as the second Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the second man, and the last Adam. The context, once again, being a comparison over against the first man and the first Adam. So, when you see language like that in the scripture, it's important that you understand it. And that's our job here, is to try to help you understand the reality of where we stand before God our legal standing before God as we emerge from the womb into this world. 
We stand before God from the get-go, before we've done any good or evil, ourselves, with our hands and our minds and our eyes and our tongues, even before we were an infant, demanding our parent give us something. Before that ever happens, we are condemned for something that took place thousands of years before we were born, before we were conceived for our parents or their parents, etc. All men means all men in that phrase. So our job is to teach you that, but it is up to each individual person who hears it to accept it. That's beyond our power. We can open the scriptures, but we can't compel you to believe. Now I say this to a room of very orthodox people, as far as I know, because we don't do daily interviews and we don't know what you're watching or what you're reading. And, but it's important to not go off the rails with the fall at the very beginning of the, of the story, as I mentioned before. Or you'll find yourself off the King's Highway later on. One of the implications of being condemned already before we even committed any personal actual sins ourselves is the implication that the trial is over. The Lord is not giving every single child of Adam an opportunity by being born to do better than Adam and therefore how they respond to God's voice with their will and their choices will be the basis upon which they will be justified or condemned. And we know that because the, this katakrima thing, this condemnation thing, that only occurs after the end of the trial. When the judge has heard all relevant evidence, only then does a just judge render a verdict. We know God is just, and so if he has revealed it by his apostles that he has entered his verdict with respect to all humanity already before we were born, the trial with respect to you and you and you and me is over. And it was over when Adam plucked that piece of fruit. That's hard for some to accept. But it is a clear implication of these words. All right. Robert, what kind of term was that? Was that a Greek term? It's a Greek term, yeah. Katakrima. Condemnation. Not to throw you off too much. Maybe this was in your target plan, but as far as the you thinking people are probably wondering the, okay. of the rest of that verse um, how do we understand when the righteousness leads to justification that to all of them? How do we understand the all of them? Yeah, the context. Obviously, uh, all those who are, who are represented by Adam will be, according to this text, associated with him in his condemnation. All those who are conversely connected to Christ will conversely be associated with him in his justification. And what do I mean by Christ's justification? And this is actually going to be very helpful, I think, to understanding justification as we do our deep dive into justification. Was Christ ever justified before God, the Father? No, he didn't need to be. He was perfect at the beginning, so he didn't need to be justified. Nevertheless, was he justified at any point between, before God the Father? Now, I didn't come here with the verse at hand, but it occurs to me that this will be very helpful for us understanding. And I always get the Timothys mixed up. I can't remember if it's 2 Timothy 3. There we go, 2 Timothy 3. All right, let's look at 2 Timothy 3. 
2 Timothy 3 and 16. You're not wrong, Elder Reininger. He did not need to be justified for himself. Let's look at verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was, Jesus was, manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Is it? You're right. You're all looking at it it's like, I... He's just making sure we're paying attention. I... Sorry. First Timothy 3. what you were going to do with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good verse. I use it a lot, but we're awake now. All right. So, no, I'm awake now. It's scared straight. All right. Great. Okay, so 1 Timothy 3:16. Uh, great indeed we confess is the mystery of, mystery of godless. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. That word translated by the ESV committee in this translation, vindicated is the word justified. And this isn't, when you've got your theological thinking cap on, and you've had your coffee, it, it, it's, it, you'll get it. You'll get the idea. Who does the Bible say that Jesus was, uh, let's put it this way, or I'll just say it. Jesus was raised, Paul tells us, for our justification. Now, how does his being raised amount to our justification? That's him, and we're us. Well, as we will see before we get to the end of this outline, in abundance, his being raised from the dead was our justification because of our union with him, because he was our representative before God. We've all heard the expressions about we we're covered with the righteousness of Christ, we are mantled with the righteousness of Christ. This is an alien righteousness, like Luther put it. It's not our own righteousness. When God looks at us when we are in Christ by faith, he doesn't assess our righteousness and decreeing that we are justified. He's looking at the perfect righteousness of Christ that covers us. And that is union language. That is representational language. So this language here, when it says he was manifested in the flesh, he was incarnated, vindicated by the Spirit, what that means is, and this is throughout the Old Testament as well, Jesus was raised from the dead, and his being raised from the dead displayed that death had no claim on him. Death only has claim on the guilty. The wages of sin is death. We all know that. And by his being raised from the dead, that justifies him. He was put to death as a malefactor and a criminal by men. But God, by his spirit, raised him from the dead because he was righteous. Death could not hold him because he was, in fact, righteous. So his being raised from the dead not only displayed his righteousness, God's verdict of righteousness, but because we are in him by faith, we partake of that righteousness. His righteousness is reckoned to be ours, imputed to us. So going back to this Adam idea and his representation of us for this bad stuff, you could also say that as we are conceived, we are covered in the unrighteousness of Adam. We are mantled in the unrighteousness of our representative, the first Adam. You see, the, you see the relationship? This is what Paul, in several places in the New Testament, is anxious to teach us. This relationship between us and the first Adam as illustrative of our relationship between us and the second Adam. He has come and succeeded where Adam came and failed. I'll 
I'll go ahead and ask for any comments or questions at this point. Doesn't this really <coughs> give us you know, a, to remember the fact that he was not only divine, but that he would not need to be justified within his divinity, but within his humanity, which is connected to us. That is the connection that really within his humanity, not his divinity. Um, yeah, he had to partake of our nature in order to be able to act as our redeemer. He did not partake of the nature of angels, as the book of Hebrews puts it. And so he had to, in order to be the second Adam, he had to be of the same nature as Adam and the rest of us who he came to redeem, certainly. But it is the person himself, the divine human person. I mean, we are correct in observing, as our ruling elders have, that Jesus Christ did not for himself need to be justified before God. But he died for us, and he was raised for our justification because of his tie with us. Well, that, that accentuates Mary. You know, bypass sinful man through Mary. The impregnated Mary by the Holy Spirit bypass sinful man so he's fully man, fully God. I mean, um, yeah, if I just if I start talking about that, we'll go we'll go off onto a rabbit trail. Yeah. It's a deep and important thought that that's worthy of its own discussion. Thank you for that, though. All right, so <clears throat> we come into this world mantled in the unrighteousness of Adam, covered in the unrighteousness. We are, his his guilt is by that language, it's the converse of the other, the other Adam. His Sin is imputed to us, whereas if you are in Christ by faith, his righteousness is imputed to you. Or it's reckoned to be yours. Now, what's important to understand is that's not a description of how you act and think in this world. When God declares you in Christ justified before him, it's important to understand he's not describing the content of your heart, he's not describing the actions of your hands, the words of your mouth. He is reckoning you as righteous. He is declaring, bringing down his gavel in his courtroom and saying, you are righteous before me. And we need to understand that that's not descriptive of who we are morally and ethically before him. It is because we are united to Christ by faith and repentance that his Righteousness is reckoned as ours, and we are mantled now in, some, in another representative's right uh, standing before God. That's critical to understand. It's the heart of the gospel. If we don't understand this idea of representation, if we don't embrace it and accept it, if we resist it and say, nobody's my, re nobody's my representative before God but me. I will stand or fall on, no. And that's not a biblical system. That's every other system. The biblical way of understanding our accountability, accountability before God is that we come into this world, the trial with respect to me already having been concluded. God has entered his verdict against me. I am guilty. Now, what does that do? What does that do? To, what, does that, what does that tell me as a person? I need to throw myself on the mercy of the court. And the biblical response, I shouldn't say response, the biblical method of dealing with that, respond, I can't help but talk that way, responding to that is to point us into the Redeemer and say, yes, you were condemned and ruined in your nature by the first Adam. Your only remedy is this other Adam over here, the second Adam. This is the Lord's Redeemer. This is my Redeemer. You have no way to escape this com comprehensive condemnation already pronounced on the whole human race because of the actions of a representative. There's no way out but one. And that's to have somebody else's, a second Adam's righteousness, come and cover you before God. This whole idea of imputing is, as I mentioned in the last uh, semester, term, whatever, the heart of the gospel. Because to the degree we don't embrace it, 
we insert our own, we insert our own conduct before God into the balances and we think we stand or fall before him either on the basis of our merits or demerits as we encounter his law and our conscience we and we um, have everything to hang upon the exercise of my, my will now we need to appreciate Adam as unfallen, as created. Let's go back to that period of time. He was able not to sin. He didn't have a fallen nature until he fell. He was in a position where he could do the good as well as do the bad. After the fall, all of his children and himself could only do the bad in God's sight. All the thoughts and intents of their heart are only evil continually from their youth up, etc., etc., etc. But before he fell, he had a liberty of will to choose the good as well as the evil. His heart had not been made stone. It was still a fleshy heart in biblical terminology at that time. So he is the only created human to have the kind of liberty of will that philosophers believe we all have. And it's important to understand that what I'm teaching, which is called Calvinism, which is just what the Bible is teaching, in my view. It's important to understand and not to character, caricature it as something it's not. We don't believe in this church that the Bible teaches that fallen man has no will at all. He does have a will. The problem is the heart behind the will all its thoughts and intents are only evil continually from man's youth up. Conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity by nature children of wrath. So what, do you ha what, what does a creature like that do with its will? Think of the will as merely a tool that allows you to have what you desire. It's a tool for getting... <coughs> what you're disposed towards. So if your heart is desperately wicked, let's put it this way. If your heart is desperately wicked, how will you choose when God's law encounters you? When you come across God's law and his commandments, the basis of sin and righteousness in this universe, how will that will respond? Well, it'll freely respond by choosing evil every time. By free, we mean free from external uh, compulsion. The human will, after the fall, is still free in a limited biblical sense. You're free from external comp compulsion. You never escape the nature of the one doing the willing when you're discussing the will. I brought this up last term. It's probably worth revisiting for a moment. Does God have a will? Of course. He determined, he willed to create the universe. He willed, he determined to send a redeemer, etc., etc., etc. So he created us in his image and likeness, and as such, we have a will. We have the power of volition. Now, does God have a nature? Yes, he has a nature. He could not impart a nature to us unless he had a nature. We are his image and likeness. So God, too, has a nature and he has a will. His nature is holy, isn't it? His nature is righteous and good throughout. There's no, there's no, shade, there's no shadow of turning within him. Can God lie? Can God exercise his will to lie? No. The Bible says God cannot lie. It's right in the, right the Bible. God cannot lie. What's the point of that? 
The point is, God's the freest being in the universe, isn't he? He is limitless in power. He is omnipotent. He can do whatever he wants. Right? But he can't lie. Why not? He free will. Because the will is just a tool for giving him what he wants, what he plans. So we can't think of the human free will as something floating out there as some entity that we partake of occasionally and that's that. No, our will is attached to these hearts. And so if we want sin when God's law comes around, if we want to reject Jesus when the gospel comes around, we are doing so freely. Nobody's compelling us to refuse Christ or to break the Ten Commandments. Nobody's compelling us from the outside. We are internally compelled by a fallen and evil nature to prefer evil to good, and therefore our will is always free in choosing the evil. Just as God's will is free only to do good, only to choose the good. So we can't run around this world and in the church thinking we have some sort of will greater than God's, a will that transcends the nature of the one doing the choosing. You can look at John 8:44 as well and talk, see that how our Lord characterizes the devil and how he's a liar by nature. But it doesn't stop Jesus from condemning him. We get the idea that if we're compelled in any way to do an evil thing, we aren't accountable for that. But that's only true if we're held to it from the outside, external compulsion, duress is the legal term. I was under duress. Well, that isn't what's happening here. What's happening here is the nature of the one doing the choosing is determining the preferences, the values, the desires of the heart. The will merely acts as the tool to seize upon what the heart desires. God being perfectly good, not a not a bit of evil within him. His will is always manifesting that heart by what he elects to do. I'll create something wonderful. There's a fall. I'll redeem a people unto myself. Always good, good things. Um, so we can't run around thinking we're freer than God. That we, can, that we are in a position with fallen hearts to choose the good as well as the evil. Maybe we spent a little too much time on that. But as God is it by, by nature and of necessity, holy and righteous and good, his free choices will always work in that direction. So fallen men and angels, their hearts being evil and unlawful and wicked, their freedom will always manifest itself in one direction only. As we are by nature from the fall. Remember we talked about the fourfold estate of man last time? Things are different now. A fallen man can only do evil with his will. Redeemed humanity can do good or evil. We are free not to sin. We aren't in bondage to sin anymore, as we'll deal with when we get to sanctification. All right. All right. So mankind has become corrupted, but he's also guilty. Are there any questions about, particularly about that, about what the scriptures teach about man's, fallen man's judicial standing before God? We talked about Romans 5.18, and it says how we are all condemned in Adam. And it's important to have that as a, uh, as a launching pad into the discussion of justification. Um, when we come back next time, let's talk a little bit about the covenant of works 
because it was in the covenant of works that Adam represented us. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll go to the Genesis 2 and, and look at that to understand the relationship between us and the first Adam as well as us and the second Adam. We need to understand this, these covenants, works and grace. Two main covenants in scripture, works and grace. And we'll talk about that. We'll start by talking about that next time. Are there any questions about this condemnation idea that we found in Romans 5.18 or this idea, which we will deal with next week, about being mantled in the unrighteousness of Adam as well as uh, inheriting his corrupt nature? So does everybody get what Josh is saying? That in the hereafter, all theologians of a sound you know, doctrine hold that there will be no more falls. That was one fall. We've got one redeemer, one redemption. That's it. No more falls. Well, in eternity of the future, if there's going to be no more falls, that means nobody's going to sin at all, anymore, ever. What happens to this, this philosophical idea of human free will then? All these people are being compelled to love God? That's not genuine love. Do you see the, does everybody see the point that he's making? Since we know that that's not true, we need to recalibrate our thinking of what freedom looks like. God is the most free being in the universe, and yet he can't sin. He can't. He can't break his law. He can't violate his character. He can't lie. I thought he was the freest. A true person, a tr- true freedom in a biblical worldview, not a philosophical Greek worldview divorced from revelation, but in a biblical worldview, the freest beings in the in that you can conceive of are ones that are unable to sin. Freedom to sin is the devil's song of true human freedom. That otherwise you believe that a human being who is inclined to evil as much as he is to good is in some sort of state of liberty, spiritual liberty that God doesn't enjoy because he's not in a position of moral equipoise between good and evil. That's a demonic lie of what freedom looks like. It's not biblical. And so we'll start next Lord's Lord's Day, God willing. Uh, by talking about, and remind me if I forget, talking about the covenant of uh, works and the covenant of grace, and then we'll move on in the outline. Let's, uh, let's close with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we